If I were to ask you all for your favorite piece of science fiction, I imagine I'd receive a wide variety of answers. Some of you might say Ridley Scott's Alien, or James Cameron's Terminator, or Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, Star Trek, Star Wars, Star Man. You might tell me it's Fallout, Deus Ex, Dead Space, Bioshock, Mass Effect. There might even be some crazy bastards out there who'd say that Death Stranding is the greatest sci-fi story ever told. About how Norman Reedus fights the metaphysical ghost people with the power of monster energy and baby. And I'm not gonna say those people are wrong, but I'd definitely do a double take to that statement. For myself, when I think about the greatest sci-fi stories ever told, my brain immediately goes to a little game that came out just two years ago, at least here in the West. Developed by Vanillaware, this game follows the stories of 13 high school students as they battle against a kaiju threat using their sentinels, giant mecha designed for combat against world-threatening enemies. When this game finally released in 2020, after six plus years of development, I didn't even know about it. I had no anticipation for this game. I'd never even seen a single trailer. I had never even played a Vanillaware game before. And apparently, I wasn't the only one. The game debuted to abysmal sales in both the East and West, and it received barely any coverage from media outlets. I myself only decided to check it out based on a recommendation from my fan base. So, with zero expectations and absolutely no pre-release knowledge, I stepped into this game, not realizing that I was about to experience one of the most batshit crazy, mind-boggling, off-the-wall, and absolutely brilliant stories ever told. By the end of its 30 plus hour runtime, my mind was spinning from the number of expertly crafted twists and turns, and from the amazing characters I'd come to know and love. Even now, years after finishing the game, I still find myself lying back in my chair, just gushing over the hours I spent with it. Whenever I'm asked for game recommendations, I always tell people, you have to play this game. Don't think about it, just do it. DO IT! The game I'm referring to, as I'm sure you've already gleaned from the title of this video, is 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. And ever since I completed this game back in early 2021, I've been wanting to make this video. I want to tell everyone and explain to them why this game is worth your time, even at full price. No, I, I swear I'm not sponsored. I'm just a nerd with an absolute raging hard on for great stories and characters. And the story that you get here is truly unlike any other. In fact, if you have not played this game yet and any of what I said catches your interest in even the slightest, enough to check the game out, then honestly, I recommend you don't watch this video. That's right. I'm telling you to leave, even after I worked so hard to get your attention with this pretty thumbnail and title. Which, by the way, huge thanks to Kazakh for her work on the thumb. So thrilled to finally work for their own something. But this entire game is one beautiful, elaborate mystery that deserves to be experienced as blind as possible. And I'd never want to ruin that for anyone. So, if you are one of these blind individuals, close this video, save it in your watch later playlist, and go buy this game right now. And after you've beaten and experienced what this game is all about, come back and listen to what I have to say. Leave a comment and tell me what that journey was like for you. I want to hear it. Now, for everyone else, whether you've already completed the game yourself or you just have absolutely no interest in it at all and you just want to hear this stupid nerd gush his weeby heart out, buckle up. Open your ears, your eyes, and your heart as I tell you all about the brilliance of 13 Sentinels each is red. First, a bit of history. Back in 2013, following the completion of Dragon's Crown, George Kamatani, 
Vanillaware's founder and director of Odin Sphere, Muramasa, and others, took the helm for yet another project. He decided that instead of going the high fantasy route, as his team had done in their previous games, they would do something they'd never done before, and create a science fiction set during the time of his youth in the 1980s. His plan was for this project to be on a much smaller scale, as he was still reeling from the huge undertaking that was Dragon's Crown. And just one quick glance at the box art and seeing that grand total of 13 main protagonists shows you all you need to know about how well that went. The project was initially pitched as a Japan-only title that would act as the basis for a special toy line, but Atlas, hot off the heels of Dragon's Crown, was already in search of a title for their international audience. So, the story concept was taken as it was, and the toy line plan was dropped, leaving only Nico to wallow in despair over what could have been. The original concept had only seven main characters, but after seeing the first artwork for the game published in 2013, Kamatani, the absolute psycho that he is, thought, seven characters? What are we, a bunch of bitches? And decided to almost double the number to 13. And as he said this, every one of the 29 Vanillaware employees slowly turned towards Kamatani with the realization that they were probably going to die in this place. At one point, there was even a plan for each of the 13 characters to have 12 possible story paths, which would have made for 165 possible variations. Fortunately for the employee's sanity, this did not end up happening. But it is for this exact reason that Kamatani himself describes the game as truly, recklessly ambitious. Because Kamatani was so invested in writing the story this time around, he decided to hand off duties for character design and artwork to Yukiko Hirai and Emika Kita. The designs themselves were based off of the work of Akira Kagami, a personal favorite mangaka of Kamatani's from his youth with the stylistic theme being girls and robots. This was also Vanillaware's first game to make use of 3D assets on top of its 2D backgrounds to create additional layering for scenes, though this did have the side effect of increasing development time. The game was originally scheduled to release on the PS4 in 2018, alongside a PS Vita version. However, the Vita version ended up getting scrapped due to budgetary constraints, and the game was delayed another year. When 13 Sentinels finally released in Japan in November 2019, it only sold 34,000 units in its opening week, ranking fifth in the charts. Kamatani feared this week's launch was due to the game's mixture of genres and struggled development, not to mention it releasing alongside other bigger titles, such as Death Stranding, Pokemon Sword and Shield, and Shenmue 3. Okay, maybe not that one. When it released in the West almost a year later, it similarly struggled to sell many units, thanks in no small part to Sony's absolutely non-existent advertising campaign. This is also likely one of the reasons I personally didn't even know about this game. There was just so little coverage and actual advertising for it, despite the game being a Sony exclusive at launch. However, these poor sales numbers didn't last. As time went on and positive word of mouth began to spread, sales for the game began to increase. Only a month after its initial low sales in Japan, the game suddenly began selling out in stores, resulting in stock shortages. Another month later, and sales reached 100,000 units. A year later, in January 2021, following the game's worldwide release, the game sold over 300,000 copies. And just this past November, a few months after the Nintendo Switch version released, physical and digital sales have now surpassed 800,000 units, putting it on track to surpassing even Dragon's Crown as Vanillaware's most sold game. So what exactly impressed people about 13 Sentinels that, despite its lack of advertising, led it to becoming Vanillaware's bestseller? The moment you load up the game, you're greeted to the game's 13 protagonists, all staring at a huge robot in the background. Also, there's a cat over there for some reason. Do you guys hear that music? It's really quiet though. Is it coming out of the robot or something? Guess it's got its own speaker system or something. Oh, holy shit! As the game starts, we're greeted to a city being attacked and a little anime girl running around, flipping up her skirt and slapping the shit out of her thigh to make a big ass robot appear. A voice then tells us to get in the robot. We laugh at the Evangelion meme that pops into our heads and we're immediately thrust into our first battle. Am I inside the robot? 
Whoa, wait, why why am I naked? Who's this Goto guy? Why are you in Sekigahara's Sentinel? Who the hell's Sekigahara? Senpai, are you like Akun too? Did you come from the future? Wait, the future? That what? Later. That area is under attack by D forces. Hold, hold on, slow down. That's the link system of the nano machines inside your brain. Seriously, I, I can't keep up with this. I can't let this turn out like Sector Three. Izumi, my name is Juro Kurab. Stop! 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 This game's intro feels like you walked into a movie two hours into its runtime, and it's also the sequel to another movie that you never watched. Names and systems are thrown at you so quickly, your brain barely has time to process what it's talking about. And I love it. I love this intro. The girl here, Iori, is essentially acting as the audience, struggling to understand what's happening and having no idea how to pilot this giant robot. And while she may know a few more things about the story than we do at this point, she's the perfect person with which to start this adventure because she is, for the most part, just as out of the loop as we are. This also helps to prevent us, as players, from being too overwhelmed by all the new information being thrown at us. As a writer, it takes a lot of confidence to willingly throw the player in the deep end right at the onset of your narrative. And the fact that 13 Sentinels deftly avoids the many pitfalls of such an approach while still making me invested in his story is a truly impressive feat. After this tutorial fight, we are seemingly thrust back in time and placed into the shoes of this Juro Karabe guy we just encountered. We walk around our class, talk to our dopey friend about kaiju movies, and have a really awkward conversation with the sleepy girl. Oh shit, it's the girl from before! And oh hey, now I've unlocked her scenario as well. Cool! So these first few sections act as the game's prologue and follow a similar structure. You get a mech battle, meet one or two new characters, unlock scenarios for those new characters, play through part of them, rinse and repeat. After seven protagonists have been unlocked, the prologue ends and you're finally set loose. The game is separated into three distinct modes, remembrance, destruction, and analysis. At this point, you can essentially tackle the game in any order you'd like, with a few small caveats that I'll get into later. Remembrance represents the third-person side-scrolling segments that we've been seeing up to this point. The gameplay here revolves around a system called the Thought Cloud. As you spend time talking with different characters and examining your surroundings, you fill up your Thought Cloud with different keywords that can be examined, or I guess considered, or presented to people in order to progress the plot. It's kind of like an adventure game, except keywords can extend beyond just items. They can represent people, concepts, places. It's actually a pretty cool little system. The top right also keeps track of your keywords, with a green blip meaning you have something to think about, and a red one meaning you have a keyword you can present to someone. Now, I, I will say, I generally enjoyed these sections. It really made me feel like I was a detective, sorting through the thoughts of my head as I investigate each area and try to piece together the story's many mysteries. Subsections require a bit of extra thinking, too, like when you're playing as Yuki Takamiya and gathering clues about your friend's disappearance alongside your weird little stalker classmate. However, since no game is perfect, I do feel I need to point out a few times where the system goes a bit too far. There are two, I repeat, two specific instances in this game where how you progress in remembrance becomes maddeningly confusing. They actually represent some of the few critiques I have against the game as a whole. Seriously, these two moments are so weirdly designed that I'm just gonna do a huge solid to all the people who haven't played and just tell you how to beat it right now. Oh, but Nico, I wanna figure it out myself. No, don't, trust me. These parts make no sense. Just let me save you the headache, okay? You ready? So. This first one is pretty early on in Iori's scenario. When you're hanging out with Miwako and Kisaragi at the bus stop, and you see a cat over to the right side of the screen. Ignore it. Don't approach that cat. Fuck that cat. I mean, no, don't fuck the cat. But fuck that cat. If at any point you approach the cat while the girls are still talking, it resets their entire conversation. So you have to start all over again. Instead, ignore the cat and just keep talking to the girls every time their name is highlighted. When they bring up getting some food, go get some soft serve. You'll see a flashback, and then that part will end. Now, pick the scenario again, and instead, 
get the crepes. Now, are you listening? Because this part's incredibly important. Slowly approach the cat till you're surprised. Don't go any further than that or you'll reset your two dumb friends again. Instead, slowly walk back to the girls, but not too far. Go till you see the prompt and call out to your friends. If you walk even a little past seeing the prompt, you get reset again. Call your friends. I'll go over the cat, watch another flashback, and congratulations, you just beat the hardest boss in the game. Okay, now for the second stupid thought cloud moment. This one actually doesn't happen for a while, as it's pretty far into Takatoshi's scenario. It occurs as you're walking around school looking for money to grab some food. He listens to some students talk about a cat and loose change, and then mentions checking under the box. Now, you might be a little confused, because there's no sparkle on the ground or any indication that that spot is examinable. Pressing X there doesn't do anything either. Okay, listen. What you have to do is stand there and think about the change keyword. That makes a big old sparkle appear that you can pick up. Now, you might be saying, well, Nico, that's not that difficult to figure out. It's clearly one of the mechanics of the game. And to that I say, then why is it the only time in the entire game that you do something like this? And why does it only appear after having played the game for like 15 hours? Seriously, these two parts are bullshit. The second one had me stumped for like 30 minutes. I ended up having to look it up. And the fact that Google autofilled the phrase 13 Sentinels loose change shows me that I was not alone in my struggles. Fortunately, these are only two small parts in a 30 plus hour adventure, so it really didn't affect my overall experience. And honestly, the fact that these are probably my biggest critiques should also be pretty indicative of how high quality the rest of the game is. Anyway, after completing the prologue, you can only pick from seven character stories, with the remaining six unlocked as you make your way through Remembrance. This usually happens when you encounter a specific character in a given scenario. Though there isn't just one way to unlock a new character route. This type of non-linear storytelling is one of the game's strongest points, because it essentially makes every playthrough a completely unique experience to the person playing. Your playthrough will likely not be the same as another person's. For example, a plot twist that you saw relatively early when you played may be someone else's endgame spoiler. It's actually why I love watching people play through this game for the first time because their order of events and the theories they form around it always lead to a different experience. Successfully achieving this type of narrative structure is no small feat either. One of the many struggles of telling a nonlinear story is maintaining plot cohesion. That is, making sure the elements of your story still tie together in a comprehensible way, no matter how you play it. 13 Sentinels raises that bar even further by giving you 13 different protagonists to choose from leading to an insane number of possible plot variations. So in order to work around this, Kamatani decided to give each character scenario a specific theme. For example, Yori Fuyusaka's story is more akin to a slice-of-life manga and focuses on her relationships with her friends and her love for the mysterious A. Sekigahara. By comparison, A's story is more akin to a detective thriller, as he uncovers the missing pieces of his identity left behind by a previous version of himself a la Total Recall. One of my personal favorite stories is Nenji Agata's, who finds himself trapped at a train station in a Groundhog's Day like never ending loop, and must use the information that he gains from each cycle to game the system and break free. All of these stories feel separate and distinct enough to be able to work on their own, while still remaining tied together by the overall narrative. And that narrative, in of itself, is basically one giant mystery. A mystery made up of many smaller questions like how and why are they time traveling? Why are there kaiju attacking them? Why do they have visions of the future? And by the end of one person's scenario, at least one of these questions is usually answered. However, the bigger questions about the state of the world, the past, the future, the sentinels, their memories, those only become clear after all the pieces come together. And the fact that the game can still have you wondering what's going to happen next all the way until its final hours is such a testament 
to the quality of writing on display here. As you progress through Remembrance and Destruction, you'll occasionally run into roadblocks that prevent you from continuing until you've completed another objective. This could include seeing a specific event in another scenario, beating a specified number of destruction fights, or even completing multiple character scenarios entirely. This does allow the game to at least have some control over the narrative, which is smart. The writers still want the beginning to be at the beginning, which is why there's a prologue, and for certain in-the-know characters, like Renya Goto, to unlock later than the others. This also helps to ensure that you're not sticking to one side of the narrative for too long. Another thing this game does brilliantly is how it pays homage to other famous works of fiction. I've already mentioned a few, like Total Recall and Groundhog's Day, but those are far from the only ones. Natsuno Minami's story, which focuses on her misadventures with her unfortunately named robot friend BJ, is a clear reference to movies like E.T. and Short Circuit. A scene where Natsuno gets hunted down by a robotic version of her friend Tomi bears a striking resemblance to the Terminator. Megumi Yakashiji's adventures with a talking cat using a magical gun to defeat evil is just Sailor Moon. And pretty much everything about Ryoko Shinonome is a reference to Rei and Evangelion. Hell, the game isn't even coy about these references. In the 2065 Ruins, Nasuno herself comments on how the invading kaiju resemble the aliens in the War of the Worlds. While little nods like these might risk coming across as pandering, or even make the story seem derivative. 30 Sentinels instead uses your expectations to its advantage. They know that you know what they're referencing, that this is just like that one thing you saw that one time. And after they've lulled you into a false sense of recognition, they pull the rug out from under you and immediately subvert your expectations. The answer to each story's mystery is never as simple as it's the thing that happened in that movie! Trust me, the moment you think you have it all figured out, the story throws yet another curveball at you that you never saw coming because you were too busy comparing this plot point to that one scene from Back to the Future. In this way, the game's story is expanded by the inclusion of these references instead of limited, as familiar story beats are turned on their heads in new and clever ways. Now, this might seem like a lot to take in. With 13 total characters, each with their own motivations, other side characters to meet, events happening, constant flashbacks, and dreams of the future, it would naturally be impossible for any normal functioning human to fully keep track of it all. This leads us to the second of the game's major modes, analysis. In here, the entirety of the game's story cutscenes, events, and terminology are stored in one easy to digest guide. At first, most of these items are locked out or shown as a series of question marks. But as you make your way through the story, these spaces will slowly fill themselves out, revealing new, important information. Sometimes even including details not brought up in any of the cutscenes. Newly acquired terms and descriptions show up as locked under the mystery file section. These are unlocked by using mystery points that you gain from playing Destruction, which I'll talk about here in a bit. Meanwhile, story events and cutscenes show up in the event archives and are filled out in chronological order, meaning you can see where in the timeline they actually take place. And man, let me tell you, this game sure loves to fuck with you in that regard. There is nothing more brain melting than going into Keitaro Miura's World War II era story, seeing a scene where an older version of himself is talking to an older version of Minami in a giant floating space station, returning to analysis and realizing that's the first fucking event on the timeline. What the hell is going on? It starts to become a routine. Anytime you complete a new chapter in someone's campaign to immediately rush back to analysis and see what new information you've uncovered. The game smartly doesn't make the mistake that many other games do with its extra lore bits by hiding it behind multiple menus on a pause screen or sticking them all in voice memos scattered across a huge level. This analysis section is literally front and center from the main menu. The game expects you to use this. They want you to uncover its mystery. And they don't hold your hand either. Aside from explaining some terminology and showing the order of events, you are mostly left to figure things out on your own. And again, 
because you can experience this game's story in almost any order, your theories will be formed around the experience you crafted for yourself. As I mentioned previously, Goto, one of the game's most knowledgeable characters, is generally one of the last characters you will unlock. However, it is possible to actually unlock him much earlier if you select the correct combination of different story paths. And goddamn, would I kill to see the theories crafted in such a playthrough. I can only imagine what it must be like experiencing his story early with almost no context and how badly it would completely fuck up your brain. It also helps that these crazy story beats are all accompanied by an absolutely stellar soundtrack. 13 Sigil's music was composed by Bass Escape, a music company led by industry veteran Hitoshi Sakamoto, who you might know from his work on Final Fantasy XII, Valkyria Chronicles, Tactics Ogre, and... Super Back to the Future 2? What? Wait, isn't that the Japanese-only game and one of the few Back to the Future games to not suck? Hold on, let, let me look this shit up. Oh my god, it is! Wow! So he actually composed his own rendition of Alan Silvestri's classic theme? Holy shit, this is actually amazing! Oh my god! Okay, sorry, I'm getting off topic. The two main gameplay modes of 13 Sentinels were each given different musical directions, with the battles making use of electronic elements and instrumentals, and the adventure sections using more analog sounds that focused on atmosphere. The first track composed for the game, Brat Overflow, acted as the game's leitmotif, with its theme incorporated into a number of other tracks. And man, does the music of this game enhance every moment of its gameplay. Whether it's the light and cheery mood of In the Doldrums, the grungy industrial beats of the Tower of Knowledge, the touching instrumentals of Faithful Struggle, or the absolute banging techno of Isolucine. This game's soundtrack delivers in spades, and I cannot praise Sakamoto and his team enough. Now, we can't possibly talk about 13 Sentinels audio without also mentioning its English dub. To be frank, this game has quite possibly one of the best English localizations I've ever heard. I'm not kidding. And it's made even more impressive when you hear just how it was all put together. Only a month after they started recording the English dub, the onset of the COVID pandemic forced them to shut down the studio. All the actors had to record their lives from home, and things like voice direction and story discussions had to be done over conference call. Christian Lamont, the game's voice director, describes in an interview the difficulties of putting together a dub like this. There is a certain flow that can be reached between an actor slash director slash engineer slash producer when a project is going exceptionally well. When everything falls into place, it is a beautiful thing. You see a story unfold organically before you as each actor learns things in harmony with their character. However, the nature of home recordings is that you never know what's going to happen between takes. What if the internet decides to go out? The neighbor decides it's time to mow the lawn. One single plane circles endlessly above just to torment you, like the beating heart in an Edgar Allan Poe story. Keeping all that in focus and still encouraging the kind of recording environment that earns the best reads and captures the best moments is a challenge. I have to give massive props to the sound engineers and editors who took all of those hours of recording and made it into something cohesive. Listening to the characters talk, you would never have guessed any of it was recorded outside of a studio. Similarly, voice director Christian Lamont, who some of you might know as the voice of Ignatz from Fire Emblem Three Houses, also deserves a ton of credit for being able to give the actors a clear understanding of scenes and guiding them towards the correct emotions to show. Seriously, voice directors don't get enough credit for how much they affect the final product. Most times, when a game's dub ends up sounding stilted or disjointed, it isn't the voice actor's fault. It's the voice director's. So the fact that they were able to dub such authentic-sounding characters around a story this complex 
and make it flow so seamlessly while also working around a pandemic is just insane to me. Wonderful work, Mr. Lamont. You are the truest of goats. That said, I'd be remiss to not also give some shout outs to the incredibly talented voice cast. Whether it's Erica Mendez and her adorably dorky rendition of Natsuno. I can't stay here that long. Can't we find another way back to the future? Laura Post's badass, tough girl persona for Yuki. Got something to say? They're the ones who laid their filthy hands on my friend. All I did was give them what they had coming. Or Zach Aguilar's polite and honest sounding Miura. I need to know one thing. What year is it? Uh, what? Every performance shines. I especially love Ben Lepley's cool and collected voice for Goto. That implies an understanding of what is like me. Or at least, that you believe you understand me. That grabbed my attention every time he was on screen. I also have to give a massive kudos to both Chris Hackney and Allegra Clark for their respective portrayals of Juro and Niori. Have we met somewhere before? A long time ago? Um, I don't think so. Both actors had to voice their characters across a number of different ages and personalities, and they fucking killed it every time. So what, you want me to abandon you here? You just need to make it through today, remember? I'm still in shock whenever I hear Iori's regular voice and realize that's the same actress that voices Boss from AI The Somnium Files. Good going, Karabi-kun. Something wrong? Well, I guess it's true that I don't give off a maternal image. I haven't done anything motherly at all, really. And hearing a robotic Juro throw snide remarks at an adult shoe never ceases to give me chills. You've been bringing me back and killing me for a long time. You even taught me to tell you how to interrupt the D-Force's production. It must have been painful if you got that out of me. However, for me, I think my favorite character in the entire game is the lovable tough guy, Nenji Agata. And a lot of that is due to his portrayal by the late, great Billy Kamets. His line delivery is so perfect. Whether it's his surprise at discovering some crazy underground lab. What in the fresh hell is this? Him butting heads with his bully rival Wajima. Yeah, boo freaking who. Or him finally confessing his love to Tomi. <sighs> I don't give a shit about my limits. I love you. And that's why I gotta break them. I, I, I... It was the perfect blend of funny and juvenile and touching. Billy Komets truly elevated this character to incredible heights. It's another reason why his passing back in June from colon cancer came as such a gut punch. He was such an incredibly talented voice actor, and based on the testaments from his co-workers, he was a quality person too. Truly, a shining star taken from us way too soon. Rest in peace, Billy. Up to this point, I've been describing this game's story and characters in some pretty broad strokes. I've done this intentionally to avoid spoiling too much of the narrative, in case there's still some of you who want to check this game out. However, in order to really go in deep and explain what makes this game so special, I do have to spoil some of the biggest mysteries of its narrative. So again, if anything I've said till now has resonated with you, anything at all, and you're even considering checking this game out, please skip to this point in the video where I talk a bit more about the gameplay. I'll give you a few moments to do that if you need to. Okay, still here? Let's move on. By the game's conclusion, you finally learn the harsh truth that humanity is in fact extinct and has been for more than 20 million years. Killed off by a nanomachine infection set into motion by the 2188 Murimura. We haven't really been time traveling at all. Instead have just been hopping around five separate sectors, each set in their own time period, starting from the 1940s and ending in the 2100s. However, even the cities themselves are all just part of a simulation. A simulation designed to provide the 15 clones who are derived from the DNA of the 15 survivors of the nanomachine incident with a necessary understanding 
of humanity's culture over the course of 20 years. But due to a piece of code inserted by the 2188 Shinonome, that period is cut short when Daimos invade to wipe out humanity every 16th year, forcing the simulation to restart from the beginning. This cycle would continue hundreds of times for thousands of years until the facility that housed their true bodies began to deteriorate. The final battle that we see in Destruction is essentially their last chance to save the human race, an all-or-nothing plan that will either free them from the simulation or trap them there forever. Uncovering the truth and solving this mystery, in addition to all the crazy plot twists that accompany it, are some of the most enjoyable moments in the game. But the story is so much more than just the mindfucky ha-ha, got him gimmick that it might sound like on paper. Even the coming-of-age themes that we see littered throughout the story are really only surface level. If we dig a bit deeper, we begin to see what this game's story truly is. A thorough deconstruction of the human psyche that attempts to determine what makes us, us. It's the nature versus nurture argument. How much of our own identity is formed by our experiences, and how much of it is just our innate nature? If we were to live life all over again, would we be the same person that we are now? To be fair, the answers to these questions aren't really clear in this game. The Juro Karabe that we see fighting in the final battle isn't the same Juro Izumi that killed his classmates in an attempt to stop the Kaiju invasion, nor is he the same as the Juro Izumi from 2188 that gunned down and killed Okino over a power supply dispute. Yet we do still see an aspect of him that carries across all these versions, a ceaseless, single-minded desire to protect his loved ones by any means necessary. Whether it be the Murray Mura from 2188, the one from two loops ago, or Yakashiji in the current loop. A trait that is just as selfish as it is selfless. Shinonome, similarly, has her own recurring character flaws. She falls in love with the self-centered Tetsuya Ida in 2188, and when her love isn't reciprocated, she chooses to doom all of humanity. 20 million years later, she falls in love with the exact same man, and upon learning his true nature and intention, kills him on the spot. Goodbye, Mr. Ida. Her response to rejection and betrayal always leads to the same outcome. Rage, nihilism, scorched earth. It's almost like history is doomed to repeat itself, regardless of any choice we as humans believe we have. Which, if that's the case, what's the point of even trying? But there's a flip side to this argument and it represents the other major theme of this story, human legacy. What will you leave behind when you die, and what can people learn from it? The Tamao Karabe of 2188 designed this simulation with this very idea in mind. If humanity were to come back, she didn't want all the history that came before to just be forgotten. Because if it is, how can we possibly be expected to improve as a species? And that's what inevitably saves everyone in this little game. Discovering the legacy of their previous selves and using that knowledge to find a way to break free. By saving their memories in Sector Zero, the Juro, Murimura, and Okino from two loops ago are able to formulate a plan to save everyone. Operation Aegis. Their knowledge of the game's systems allows them to divert resources into the creation of the Sentinels, which they use to fight the Daimos. The mistakes made in previous loops aren't forgotten, but are instead used as stepping stones towards a fully realized solution. And when all the pieces are finally in place, the three of them entrust their future to the next generation. Hell, you can even see the same theming in the Sentinels themselves with each subsequent generation building upon the foundation of the previous. I think that is the true moral of the story. We can only avoid the sins of our forefathers by never forgetting them. 
That's how we escape repeating history. That's how we become better than who we were. And I, I don't know. I just think that's a really powerful message to give its players. It's never hopeless. The future isn't written in stone. As long as we're willing to learn from our mistakes, there's always hope for a brighter tomorrow. All right, I think it's time we talked about the third and final of the major modes, Destruction. The events of this mode actually occur after a majority of the story beats in Remembrance, and take place during the final battles against the Daimos. As such, characters will often reference events that have already transpired, but you, the player, have yet to see, which leads to some really cool moments of foreshadowing. Or pre-shadowing? I don't know. Combat and destruction can be described as real-time strategy meets tower defense. Before a fight, you pick six sentinels to fight on the front lines, while the remaining seven act as AI turrets that surround and guard the Aegis, which is the tower you're trying to defend. Characters are moved around a map grid in order to attack enemies using a menu system, a lot like a tactics game. Most missions, the objective is to either kill all the waves of enemies or simply survive until the timer runs out and the Aegis activates, which in turn will destroy all the enemies. Most of the attacks that the Sentinels use cost EP, and if that depletes, they'll have to defend to recharge it. You can also repair your Sentinel in the middle of a fight, but this is usually a bad idea as it ejects your pilot for a period, leaving them open to attack. Similarly, the same thing will happen if a Sentinel sustains too much damage. If any of your pilots die outside their Sentinel, it's game over. The Sentinels themselves are divided into four categories. The first generation, which specializes in close range fights. The second generation, which are relative all-rounders. The third generation, which are slow moving long range units. And the fourth generation, which are nimble aerial units. Generally, having one of each is necessary in most fights as they all have their strengths and weaknesses. The game actually encourages you to switch out pilots frequently as your frontline party will eventually burn itself out if they fight in too many subsequent battles. The enemies you encounter are also diverse and vary from small weak kaiju that attack in swarms, to giant hulking beasts that tank damage, all the way to enormous factories that continuously produce kaiju until they're destroyed. Over time, you'll unlock new abilities for each of your sentinels using the metachip currency you earn from fights. These chips can also be used to upgrade each ability to a maximum of eight levels, increasing their strength and decreasing cooldown. Similarly, individual pilots can also unlock their own unique skills after reaching certain levels, though these are relatively minor, like getting an attack boost when fighting alongside a specific character, or healing the party a little when defending. You do also get the ability to upgrade individual stats on each sentinel, but this system isn't unlocked until way later in the game, and honestly isn't even necessary for completing the main campaign. You already level up normally from fights anyway, so this upgrade system feels more like something put in place for the endless battle mode that unlocks once you've finished the game. When you complete a mission, you're given a ranking from D to S based on how well you did, as well as how many bonus objectives you completed. The score you get also determines how many mystery points you acquire, and are used to unlock extra lore bits in the analysis section, which is a pretty great way to tie the two most together, gameplay-wise. I've seen most people say that the destruction segments are the weakest part of the game, and I do and don't agree with that. The game's story is phenomenal, and as such, anything else is likely going to seem worse by comparison. But honestly, I got a lot of enjoyment out of this game's battle system. It definitely isn't the deepest combat, and if you aren't a fan of RTS or tower defense games, this likely will do very little to change your mind, but even casual fans of the genre will find some fun to be had here. It's pretty satisfying blasting away hordes of kaiju with a thousand missiles and seeing the entire screen erupt in an explosion of lights. Fortunately, the game does come with difficulty settings, so if you have no interest in the battles, you can just switch it to easy and blast through with no problems. For everyone else, I'd actually recommend picking the hardest difficulty, Intense, as I found the base difficulty to be a bit too easy. Funnily enough, my biggest critique against the battle system may have actually been remedied since I last played it. In the original version of the game, the Sentinel pilots didn't really feel all that unique from each other. Their individual pilot skills didn't affect gameplay much, 
and each generation of Sentinels generally shared from the same pool of moves. Similarly, a lot of the strategy kind of went out the window, even on the hardest difficulty, once you realize just how absolutely busted the sentry gun ability was. There are automated turrets that you can place on the map that constantly fire at enemies and rarely ever die. Throw enough of them down and you didn't even need a fight. Well, apparently, after the release of the Switch port, the destruction gameplay got updated across all versions of the game, adding new, completely unique abilities to each of the pilots and also nerfing the sentry guns. I haven't really tested this to find out for myself, but the word seems to be that the game is much more balanced now. The fact that Vanillaware went out of their way to do that instead of just simply porting the game is honestly really awesome. I do feel there's one other important aspect to this game's development that's worth mentioning. As you've likely noticed, this game is ambitious. You might even say it's recklessly ambitious, as its own director puts it. And that ambition did come at a cost. While it might be hard to notice on a first playthrough, when going back over the story, you'll start to notice a number of instances where plot lines seemingly start and end almost immediately. This is due to, as clarified by Kamatani himself, a large amount of cut content, or stuff they had planned to include, but just ran out of time and money. This includes scenes that would have better explained Shinonome and Goto's previous relationship, a whole sub-story about an AI Takatoshi, and 1945 Tamal Karabe having a much bigger story role. In fact, Kamatami has even gone on record to say that at least 50% of the original story had to be cut. While a small part of me is a bit saddened knowing that Kamatani's vision wasn't fully realized here, that isn't to say that all this cut content would have necessarily improved the story. Apparently, there were supposed to be even more slice of life sections like Yori's spread throughout the game. To be honest though, there's a good chance that those would have killed the game's relatively good pacing. Yori's scenario already suffers a bit from focusing too much on these school day activities, rather than the actual interesting sci-fi narrative. Even looking back at what was originally planned, where every character would have had 12 possible story paths leading to over 100 possible combinations, I feel that would have muddied the game's relatively focused narrative. So, while content being cut can be disappointing, especially when you think about what could have been, given the phenomenal story we did get here, it may very well have been a blessing in disguise. I'd actually like to close this video by stepping away from the game for a moment, and instead talk a bit about the lead creator behind 13 Sentinels. George Kamatani. As a child, Kamatani dreamed of being a filmmaker. He was fascinated by movies, particularly ones with crazy special effects. But because he was unable to afford a camera of his own, he instead turned to video games. He was deeply affected by an RPG called The Black Onyx, which marked the beginning of his love of fantasy and Norse mythology. In high school, he worked as a subcontractor and 2D pixel artist for several Famicom games before eventually joining Capcom as an artist and designer in 1992. His first game directing gig was on Princess Crown, which he did as part of the Kansai branch of Atlas. However, the game was a commercial failure, and Kamatani and his team were blacklisted in the industry. He eventually managed to acquire a job with Enix as part of the core staff for a game called Fantasy Earth. It was here that he also met and befriended composer Hitoshi Sakamoto who would go on to compose many of his game's OSTs. In order to facilitate the development of Fantasy Earth, Kamatani formed a new company of only three employees. It was originally called Pura Guru, but during Square's merger with Enix, Kamatani's company left production. They changed their name to Vanillaware, a name meant to evoke the enduring and timeless popularity of vanilla ice cream. Their company philosophy was simple. They wanted to create original games based entirely around their own taste. Unlike many other standard companies, Vanillaware was made up of a majority of artists, and they wanted their focus to be specifically on 2D art. It's why so many of Vanillaware's games have such a recognizable look to them. The company would go on to produce a number of successful games, including Odin Sphere, Muramasa the Demon Blade, and Dragon's Crown. However, 13 Sentinels was a special game for Kamatani. On the eve of the game's release in the West, Kamatani wrote a special message to the players describing 13 Sentinels as, and I quote, an attempt to redefine what storytelling in a game could be. I consider this title to be an amalgamation of everything within me, a culmination of all of my past experiences and creative skills, 
packed with my feelings and respect for my inspirations. In truth, I doubt we'll ever be able to create a game the same way we did this one. Still, I'm sending this game off with my head held high, knowing we crafted something worth taking pride in. A game I truly feel is Vanillaware's best work to date. I sincerely hope everybody who plays the game enjoys it as much as we did making it. When I finished playing 13 Sentinels for the first time, I felt that I had experienced something that I've very rarely felt in other games, even good ones. And that was an unbridled and fervent passion by the developers to make something that would stick with you long after the credits rolled. I felt it in every word of dialogue, in every tender moment, and in every intricate plot twist. These guys fucking gave a shit, man. The fact that this game somehow managed to tell the story that it did, the way it did, and not have the precarious house of cards it was built upon come crashing down in the process blows my mind. Their dedication to this project made every emotional gut punch hit 10 times harder than it would have. 13 Sentinels did something most games rarely attempt and even fewer succeed in doing. It defied the genre norms and carved its own path to make something truly unique and wonderful. Even now, as I think back on my playthrough of this game, I'm in awe. I feel inspired. This game inspires me. It's inspired me to rethink other stories in the genre, to look at my own stories, to strive to be a better writer. The whole reason I'm even making this video at all is because I want other people to experience what I experienced. And even if my primitive description here fails to properly do justice to how amazing this game is, I still want to try. Because the passion, the love, and the commitment that encompasses every square inch of this game, that is the true brilliance of 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. Hey, thank you guys so much for watching. I uh, hope you all enjoyed this kind of different video for me. Leave a like if you did, and uh, let me know if it's something you'd want to see more of in the future. I really did enjoy uh, writing this and talking about this special game. Even two years later, I still can't stop thinking about it. If you haven't already and would like to watch in real time as I fall in love with the game, you can check out my full blind playthrough that I did back in 2020 and definitely ended up being one of my favorite Let's Plays as well. And maybe consider subscribing and becoming a picky penguin aboard the SSLP where the days are always sunny and the vids are always funny. But uh, anyway, that's all for me for now. And as always, guys, till next time, stay classy.